Yes, perfect. Very good. Okay, sorry about that. Um, so again, I'm sorry that I can't be there in person with you guys, um, but you know, happy to have been invited um, to talk a little bit about some of what I do uh, for Forage Genetics, which is talking about and promoting alfalfa's role in sustainable agriculture. Um, I think it's no secret that you know when we're looking when we're looking at uh, programs that are focused on sustainability, a lot of the emphasis is put on annuals, you know, different cover crop species. And really, I think that that's a shame because I think that alfalfa deserves a lot of um, attention in this realm and for many of the reasons that we're going to be discussing. And I know that some of the previous presenters have probably talked about some of the points that I'm going to uh, present here during my presentation. Um, but again, just to kind of go over all of the potential benefits that we can be thinking about with alfalfa. So it doesn't want to look like it's there we go. Okay. So just kind of high level, some of the benefits that we see of including alfalfa in our cropping rotations, you know, we have the carbon benefits that we're finding from different research studies across the US. Obviously nitrogen benefits, which are becoming more and more important, especially this year when we're looking at the prices of nitrogen fertilizers just skyrocketing, in some cases about 300% increases. Um, we also see some soil microbial benefits, as well as just overall kind of ecosystem benefits as well. And you know, I threw on this list nutritional benefits. I'm not gonna specifically talk about those today, but I think that it's pretty well established that alfalfa is a very high quality forage that we have, uh, that we are able to feed to our livestock in terms of improving protein intake, energy intake, et cetera. And I, I do need to give credit too for the title of this, Regeneration Nation. I, I was not the fortunate one to, be, to come up with that, uh, slogan that belongs to the National Alfalfa and Forage Alliance, NAFA. Um, they actually have this campaign, Regeneration Nation, and we do have a website um, that you can Google Regeneration Nation, um, which has a lot of this information available as well. And you know, NAFA is doing a really good job promoting alfalfa's role in sustainable agriculture when we're talking to different representatives and senators um, that, that represent uh, various states across the US. So when we look at alfalfa and how it can stack up to other cover crop species, as well as these common species that are grown, you know, corn and soybean, we really see that alfalfa has potential to really improve a lot of different areas. So like I mentioned, for carbon sequestration, I'll show you some research that we're finding here where alfalfa's potential um, compared especially to things like corn and soybean is, is optimal in terms of sequestering that carbon and deep in the soil. Because of its deep taprooting structure, it also has that ability to improve the overall soil structure. And then the nitrogen credits, like I mentioned, you know, when we're talking about how much nitrogen is added back to the soil, really we're able to maximize that amount when we include alfalfa. And this doesn't necessarily have to be in those long rotations that we're considering, you know, three, four or more years. Even in rotations where we're only including alfalfa for say one or two years, we still see those nitrogen benefits. Um, water use efficiency, I'm going to touch on a little bit, you know, alfalfa generally has a, a bad rap, if you will, um, for how much water it uses. However, there are some things that we need to consider um, when we're talking about how much water alfalfa is going to need to produce, say, a ton. Um, but we also need to think about how it can be used in landscapes where we're starting to see drought occurring more often. Decreased erosion. Um, decreased nutrient leaching, leaching. These are also some benefits that we see with including alfalfa, and then that increase in soil microbial diversity. So jumping into the carbon sequestration, this is obviously a, a very important topic right now. We're seeing a lot of focus all the way from the federal level and a lot of programs that they are putting out there, um, as well as, you know, to the farmer level and looking at some interest in entering the carbon markets and gaining some uh, financially from selling carbon markets on, or sorry, sell it excuse me, selling carbon credits on the market. And I really love this picture. You know, we use this a lot in our meetings with legislators because it compares alfalfa roots to corn and soybean. And when we look at alfalfa, especially when it's in the ground for say two, three or four years, you know, we know that it has that ability to grow um, its deep tap root very um, far into the soil layers. On average, you know, there are estimates that say that alfalfa's roots can grow about five feet per year in a prime environment. So that's if, you know, there's no sort of hard pan layers or any sort of rocks that could hinder that growth and development. So this just shows a really good comparison. And when you're thinking about this and thinking about what's adding carbon back to the soil, we know that decomposition of roots is a big part of that. It's a main part of that. 
And so with those deeper uh, root layers, it's placing that carbon deeper into that soil. So it's able to hold it a little bit better than maybe some of that carbon that's placed closer to that soil surface. So some research that has looked at the potential for alfalfa to sequester carbon in the soil. Um, one of these was a paper that was published in 2018 and it looked at alfalfa compared to a perennial grassland. And they were managing them both as they would normally. So we were harvesting off the alfalfa, um, they were grazing off the grassland. And what they actually were able to find in this particular study is that we had improved carbon sequestration in those alfalfa fields, even when that herbage mass was removed compared to that perennial grassland that was used maybe a little bit lighter. And, and there was a couple of different reasons for that. But again, I think the moral of the story there is that alfalfa really does deserve a, a seat at the table, if you will, in this whole conversation around carbon sequestration. So just some other research, and I'm gonna go through this fairly quickly um, because I think it just shows that we do have research out there that really supports this idea of alfalfa and its ability to sequester carbon. Particularly when we're comparing it to say a continuous corn situation, you know, we really see that that's when we maximize those benefits or if we have any situations where fallow is introduced into that rotation. Um, this particular figure that's on the slide here, while it's very old, it's from 1992, which to me seems like it should only have been like five years ago, but I know that it's about 30 years ago now. Um, I really like what it depicts here. And you know, it shows this comparison of corn and fallow. Here are these lines um, with the, the circles and the triangles. And then it shows the alfalfa. And we're looking at that carbon content over time. So if years one through five of these particular rotations. And you can see that the carbon content here in the fallow in the continuous corn fields is decreasing slightly. You know, we're not seeing any sort of significant improvements. But when they were directly measuring that soil organic carbon in the alfalfa fields, we do see this pretty nice jump, this pretty nice increase in that soil organic carbon content. And again, this is not the only research project that is finding those results. We see that in several different projects around the US where they're measuring that soil organic carbon, um, they are seeing the, those increases that, um, in that soil organic carbon. Now, I don't wanna be misleading. I don't wanna say that all the research out there is favorable in this regard. We do know that there has been some recently published results where it's showing that alfalfa has stay net neutral contributions in terms of adding soil organic carbon back. Um, Sometimes, you know, management is going to play a big role in that. So whether the stand is irrigated or whether it's dry land, especially in these semi-arid environments, um, how often it's man or harvested, excuse me, those all play a big role. So what I, the takeaway for me is at this point is that there's a lot more research that needs to be done. Overall, it seems very favorable that alfalfa has the ability to add a lot of carbon back to the soil. But before we start assigning a lot of money or dollar values and, and estimating the tons of carbon that can be added back from alfalfa, I would highly encourage that we, we continue digging, we continue finding more results. Um, in speaking to some of the researchers that are doing this work right now, they feel very confident that alfalfa has the similar ability to many of our cover crop options in adding that carbon back to the soil. Um, but necessarily how much is really the big question at this point. But one thing that I think that we are all finding is that including alfalfa into the, the system and in, into your cropping rotation, that practice change of adding that perennial forage, that is where we're, we are seeing that benefit. We are seeing um, significant improvements in overall soil health. And so the programs that are looking at rewarding these practice changes rather than necessarily um, assigning dollars per ton of carbon sequestered, you know, alfalfa really can play a big role in that right now if we were to launch it to, you know, today. The one I really want to focus on here is looking at alfalfa's ability to, um, to decrease our reliance on synthetic nitrogen fertilizer. Um, like I said, especially in today's environment, we know how important that is. We know the cost of inputs are rising, um, and it doesn't seem like this cycle is going to be very short. They're predicting two to three years, potentially, in some cases. And alfalfa, when we look at the different leguminous crops, whether annual or perennial across the board, alfalfa really maximizes our potential nitrogen credit. And you know, depending on what research you're looking at, we can see some credits ranging anywhere from say 50 pounds of nitrogen per acre 
all the way up to even 200 pounds of nitrogen per acre. Again, environment, soil type management, that's all going to play a role. However, we do know that alfalfa adds a significant amount of nitrogen back. And I think that that's, again, some, a really important consideration um, to be thinking about, you know, how can you incorporate that? How can you use that benefit to your advantage? Um, some research out of the Midwest found that you could potentially decrease nitrogen fertilizer inputs by about 14%. Um, research out of Utah is showing um, in support that we don't necessarily need to apply any sort of nitrogen after alfalfa in the rotation um, because there's enough supplied there, whether it be for corn or even small grains. And again, we're seeing this not just in Utah, in the Midwest research as well. And I think it's really important to talk about not only do we see a nitrogen benefit in that first year out of alfalfa, we're seeing a benefit in year two as well. So we may not be able to cover 100% of the nitrogen requirements of the crop two years out of alfalfa. However, we can significantly reduce it. Um, and again, that's, gonna, that's really important. And I think that that's gonna maintain the importance and maintain that economic significance for the next couple of years and beyond. The other benefit that we see is that by including alfalfa in our rotations, we have what we call as a rotation effect. And that can be due to many different things, whether it be from breaking up pest cycles, um, you know, improving that overall soil health, the soil tilth. We do see increases in yield of the crop following alfalfa. Research is estimating anywhere from about 10 to 20% yield boost, again, just by including alfalfa in that rotation, that non-nitrogen rotation to benefit. So again, we really do see some financial advantages to just having alfalfa in, even if it's for a short term. One particular project, and again, I apologize, this is out of the Midwest. This is where we get a lot of our really good alfalfa kind of economic numbers. Um, but this particular project was looking at alfalfa in short-term rotations. So they were looking at three years or less, and that three years includes that seeding year. And they were looking at how that cycle or how including alfalfa at that time period affects overall on-farm economics. And that's with alfalfa followed by corn. And when they compared continuous corn to corn grown after two to three years of alfalfa, they were finding significant improvements in that on-farm income. And this was due to, again, reductions in need for synthetic nitrogen fertilizer application. And it was also due to that improvement in corn yield. So we're kind of having this win-win where we're putting less inputs into the system and we're actually getting more out of that. So that resulted in more dollars in the growers' pockets. And again, you know, these numbers are, are gonna vary. When they ran this particular figure here, they were pricing corn at about $4 a bushel and they actually had nitrogen priced right around a dollar per pound. So these numbers would change a little bit looking at today's environment where corn is obviously priced significantly higher. Um, you know, nitrogen is priced a little bit higher, but fairly similar to what they were using here. And then this is a, a project that came out of you know, Dan Putnam's lab. Um, so a little bit closer to you guys here, but they were doing something very similar. They wanted to look at um, what alfalfa in rotation did to wheat production. Um, whether they had alfalfa or if they were just doing a continuous wheat uh, system. And so they were looking at three different uh, locations. So they had Davis, Kearney, and Tule Lake. And what this is, is really interesting, and I'll actually blow one of these up so it's easier for you guys to see. So they're looking at, in this particular one, um, they were looking at the, the wheat yield, so the tons per acre, and this is in year one. And then they were looking at, on the x-axis, different rates of nitrogen that was applied anywhere from zero pounds of nitrogen per acre all the way up to 250. One thing that I wanna point out is when we look at that zero nitrogen applied, okay? The darker bars are the, the wheat biomass that's following alfalfa, the lighter bars is the wheat on wheat. And with zero nitrogen included, we already are starting off significantly higher in terms of tons per acre of wheat produced. When we start adding some nitrogen, we do see some, some small benefits. But when you look, it takes about 100 pounds of nitrogen per acre to even equal the wheat biomass that was produced from alfalfa with no nitrogen, okay? And then we actually see that at that rate, we do have a, an increase in the wheat biomass following alfalfa. Again, that's due to that rotational effect as well. 
So we really do see some significant improvements in small grains as well as corn um, following alfalfa versus just that continuous cycle. The other benefits that we see are, are some upstream benefits. So we know that production of nitrogen fertilizer is a very energy intensive process. Um, some estimates are looking at three tons of carbon are utilized for every ton of urea produced. Ammonia nitrate is a little bit lower, around two tons of carbon utilized for every ton of ammonia nitrate produced. So again, we have to factor that in when we're looking at that on-farm sustainability. If we're able to reduce our need for nitrogen fertilizer, we're reducing the, the requirements for that process, we're reducing the energy required, plus we're also having that potential to, to or that ability to potentially sequester more carbon in the soil. So again, when we're talking about a win-win situation, alfalfa really has it all, um, especially if we're trying to improve that carbon uh, sequestration ability. Other things that we can see from decreasing our reliance on synthetic fertilizers, you know, we're decreasing emissions from equipment. Potentially, we're not having to apply as much fertilizer. You know, and I do want to throw out there, we still have to apply, you know, phosphorus, potassium, and sulfur in some situations to alfalfa. Um, but you know, we're reducing the requirement to apply that nitrogen. We do reduce the emissions from the production of fertilizer. And then again, we're potentially increasing that carbon sequestration. The other thing, if you're interested in looking at some of these sustainability programs, some programs do reward for decreasing your nitrogen application. A lot of times that's labeled as improving nitrogen use efficiency. The problem that we're having and in my work with these different companies is that when they're citing methods for this, whether it be you know, how you're applying that nitrogen fertilizer um, or, or you know, again, green manuring and things like that, a lot of times alfalfa is not included as a method for improving your nitrogen use efficiency. Or the other thing that we're running into is if you include alfalfa in your rotation and you say grow corn next and you don't apply any nitrogen that year in corn, they're actually applying that nitrogen credit to corn rather than the alfalfa that was grown the prior year. So we're kind of working and, and at trying to fix some of those bugs so alfalfa can get that spotlight, can get the, you know, the recognition that it deserves. Um, right now though, we're still working on that. We're still working on educating you know, and, and trying to figure out exactly how we can incorporate that into those models. So some other things that I do want to just bring to your attention again, you know, I already mentioned alfalfa in those short term rotations. And when I say short term, what I mean is, again, two to three years, we're looking at terminating the alfalfa when it's at peak production. And that can be really hard. I completely understand that. You know, if you see a beautiful alfalfa field, the last thing that you want to do is go in and turn it under. But if we're talking about maximizing not only our, our forage yield, but maximizing that nitrogen contribution, that's the ideal time to do it. And that's actually what we've been finding economically to make the most sense, not draw it out, not wait for that alfalfa stand to decline, you know, decrease in plant density, um, decrease in overall yield. We're losing money by doing that. If we rotate those stands out quicker, we are seeing improvements in the yields of, you know, the corn or the small grains, whatever you're growing behind it, and then you go back into that alfalfa again and you're saving on those, that nitrogen fertilization as well. The other idea, it's not a new idea by any means, but it's one that we're revisiting a little bit, is looking at alfalfa in that annual situation. And so for you guys, you know, where you're located in Arizona, you're already using non-dormant alfalfa varieties. The idea behind this, again, is to just plan it for one year so you can get back to your row crop you know, again, whether it be corn, whether it be grains, small grains, excuse me, getting that nitrogen credit, you still are going to see a nitrogen benefit, even if alfalfa is only grown for a single year. We also see that pest cycle benefit as well, and that's going to improve our overall soil health. So it, it sounds kind of odd, perhaps, to only be growing alfalfa for one year because alfalfa is a perennial, but we're still seeing a lot of benefits from using this way. And we're actually looking at bringing this idea farther north. Um, they did this, they promoted it back in the 80s. We're revisiting that, taking some of these higher fall dormancy alfalfa varieties and utilizing them as an annual in places like Minnesota and Wisconsin and, and even the Dakotas of Montana. 
So just some underground benefits then, again, I'm kind of rehashing some of the ideas that I already brought up here earlier. Um, but when we're looking at overall soil health, soil aggregation, you know, including alfalfa because it's a perennial. So kind of don't listen to what I just said in that last slide, going back to that idea of that traditional three to four or more years of alfalfa. Having that perennial in there decreases our need to cultivate the soil, to break up that soil. It provides that cover. It has that deep tap rooting system. That is going to help increase the size of our soil aggregates. And especially when we compare that to a continuous corn situation. We'll also find changes in soil microbial um, populations. We're seeing potentially reductions in nitrogen loss. You know, alfalfa is a really great nitrate scavenger. Um, so this is going to actually help to decrease any sort of nitrates that could potentially be introduced into waterways. And then we're just seeing some changes, like I said, in those microbial populations that potentially um, can improve overall plant growth as well as some biocontrollabilities, which uh, some labs are looking into a little bit further. And kind of the, the take home message that we're getting from this is that alfalfa in rotation is creating more stable soils that are more resilient to some of these changes. So these extended periods of drought um, in some areas like where I'm at in Pennsylvania, where we're getting a lot of rain, um, is just creating soils that are gonna be a little bit more responsive to that and able to, to you know, withstand some of these climatic differences. We also know decreased erosion is a huge benefit from alfalfa. And again, that, that's mainly due to the fact that we put it in the ground and we keep it in there for several years. Um, so by having that you know, constant vegetative cover, taking advantage of that entire growing season, um, we're really seeing some improvements in you know, reducing soil runoff, keeping the soil in the field where it's supposed to be. Um, that cover will help to break up the size of the raindrops, which doesn't sound like a big deal, but that can actually have a pretty significant impact on erosion and water flow off of fields. And so overall, you know, what we're finding is that by and large, alfalfa is gonna reduce the run, runoff, even with sloped fields. It's gonna increase that water infiltration rate, which is so important, um, especially for getting water deeper into those soil layers. Um, and then, you know, as the alfalfa grows, it gets a little bit bigger, these impacts are even more pronounced. Now, water utilization, I don't want to spend a whole lot of time on this. You know, this is a very tricky subject. We all know that alfalfa utilizes a lot of water, um, but we also know that it actually is fairly efficient. When we look at how much water is necessary per ton of alfalfa produced, it actually ranks pretty well, like pretty high up there um, in terms of our various crops options. The big benefit that we see with alfalfa is again, that deep tap root has the ability to access those deep soil moisture layers um, that other crops do not have the ability to do. So it's gonna be more resilient to drought. So when we have these time periods where we only get a little bit of water up front at the beginning of the season, you know, alfalfa can respond to that, can respond well. And then when the water shuts off, we can just let that plant go dormant. Um, one of the previous speakers might've already talked about this, you know, we have these conversations about how to manage water and how to manage uh, irrigation on alfalfa. And one of the things that I, I've seen time and time again is that if we do have to turn the water off later on in the season, we don't necessarily want to turn it back on if we get a little bit more. Um, what research is showing is that the, the kind of what you don't want to do is allow that alfalfa to come out of dormancy to break dormancy late in the season. Um, and then the water goes off again because that's just going to cause a lot of stress but it just shows how responsive it can be to water when we do have that availability back. So again, it's a really good option because we just don't always know how much water is gonna be available to us from one season to the next. Um, decreased nutrient leaching. Um, this is another big one that's often overlooked. And you know, I'm seeing this here, I'm located in Pennsylvania in the Northeast. We're actually seeing some instances where they are recommending alfalfa to be planted in rotation specifically for this purpose. So to help clean up any sort of pollution um, that's entering in our waterways, we know it's great at soaking up nitrates. Um, we have a couple instances also in Minnesota where the water district uh, asked dairies to grow alfalfa again to just help decrease some of that introduction of nitrates into the waterways. So it's a really great nitrate scavenger. It's able to soak up all these excess nitrates from the soil um, and convert that into protein. It's used in chemical mediation sites. 
So a really famous one is, you know, what was covered in the Aaron Brockovich movie. Um, alfalfa was actually grown to help soak up those pollutants again and clean up that waterway as well. Um, so we know that this is a huge benefit um, and, and one that I think, again, needs to be explored even more, especially if we're looking at, you know, trying to use any of this water again for reclamation sources. Pest cycle benefits, another thing that I've mentioned multiple times. You know, I think it's, it's another overlooked benefit as well. The fact that we're harvesting alfalfa multiple times a year, that can really have a huge, significant benefit um, or significant impact, excuse me, on these pest cycles. So if we're talking about weeds, you know, one of the main goals with weed control is to not allow that weed to produce seed. Well, with alfalfa, because we're harvesting it multiple times, we're cutting that weed off as well. So we're stopping its growth, making it start over potentially, um, which is going to reduce the spread of that weed. We also see this, you know, when we're including alfalfa in our corn or small grain rotations, you know, alfalfa is not necessarily going to be a host to many of the same diseases or insects that are going to affect those grass species. So it can be a really good mitigator for a lot of these pest problems. And just by increasing the diversity of our cropping systems, that really just helps to, to disrupt those pest cycles. We see changes in weed species by including alfalfa in those rotations, especially when we're growing it for multiple years. Um, so that's a really good biological control for a lot of these different weeds. And then of course, we also have our wildlife benefits. It's a perennial, so it provides that stable habitat, that stable food source. Whether we're talking about, you know, large ruminants, which may or may not be a good thing, depending on who you're asking, um, you know, elk, deer, whatever uh, is, is in your area, love to feed on alfalfa because it has that high feed value, it's very palatable, but it's also a really good habitat for insects, for rodents, for things like that, that are all very important to our overall ecosystem, as well as pollinators. And we know that there's been a lot of emphasis put on poll pollinator health over um, recent years, and alfalfa is a great contributor to that. So our challenge as alfalfa growers um, is highlighting all of these benefits that alfalfa has to offer. At this point in time, I can tell you that when we're looking at different um, carbon credit models, you know, sustainability models, alfalfa often is kind of an afterthought. It's not, emphasis is not placed on it. You know, cover crop species gets a lot of, of those focuses. Um, I have some really good examples that I found just with these different programs. You know, when we're talking about the practice changes that qualify for some of these program payments, things like diversifying your crop rotation is in there, but alfalfa is not specifically managed. Uh, mentioned. When well, we're talking about this particular program highlighted at the bottom here, you know, they're looking at how much money can you get for some of these practice changes. For converting to no-till, no you get $3 per acre a year. For by including cover crops, you're getting $6 per acre per year, but no mention of alfalfa. And so this is, I think, our job is to really promote where alfalfa fits in a lot of these programs if we're truly trying to make a difference and truly trying to improve our overall sustainability. So just kind of in summary then, you know, alfalfa really has the potential, I think, to be the gold standard for what, if we wanna call it regenerative cropping. And this is nothing new. I know I'm preaching to the choir here. You know, we've been practicing sustainability, right? Farmers, ranchers, that's, they're in the business of sustainability. But I think we need to do a better job at looking at, you know, how can we highlight exactly what we're doing and what are some of the practices that can really maximize our, our benefits here? Um, including it in our rotations with corn and soy, you know, that is where we're going to really see those maximum benefits. And that's not just limited to the nitrogen credits. You know, we are seeing the, those uh, research projects that are finding those benefits in terms of carbon sequestration. We know we have improvements in soil health and decreasing erosion. We just need to talk about it more. We still need to continue doing research to, again, figure out the best management practices. But overall, you know, by including alfalfa, we can really help boost our overall yields. When we're looking at that holistic, long-term on-farm profitability, you know, alfalfa really does have a role here. And I think that we just need to put more emphasis on it. So with that, I um, would be happy to answer any questions if, there, if we have time for that. Um, otherwise, you know, I, I thank you so much again for this opportunity.